So I actually, I actually didn't uh, purposely didn't want to or didn't prepare a talk because I don't know. It seems like that uh, in the past when I've given talks, I just end up talking the whole time, and there's not that much time left for questions. And so I thought maybe it'd be nice to do this more like a meeting like we used to have in Raleigh, although in Raleigh I didn't have everybody facing me. We are generally, generally in a circle. Um, but the, and I, and I have a, 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 a couple pieces of correspondence that I might read depending on if, you know, how, how the conversation develops. Um, but the theme of the meeting, the heart of the matter, um, made me think about, well, what would I say about that? What is the heart of the matter? And I kept coming back to, uh, I think the heart of the matter is uh, what, what is the focus of your attention? Um, you know, even, even starting as a, as an in, from infancy, what is, what, what, ocu what is the focus of the attention? I said your attention, and maybe it's your attention, but there's an attention. Uh, um, and it's, seems to be inextricably wrapped up with um, your need for self-definition. You know, we're, we, we, we start our life, and, and at some early age, we, you know, we're keenly aware of ourselves as an individuality, but we don't know who we are in the world. And so we're, you know, we, we spend our lifetime trying to define ourselves. And... If, if well, let me back up because uh, one thing really struck me about the rapport setting we just had, and that was how uh, I think for a lot of people in the room, if not everybody, that the object of your attention during that period of time was still silence, and that's really unusual because in medit if you meditate by yourself, you know that that cycle that Mike talked about, the circle where you're, you drift into thought. I mean, that happens in, uh, even in a rapport setting, but there are a, a, a level of intensity I felt in that session, and I think it, it's, not on, it's not rare for rapport. I mean, that's a fairly common thing to happen. Uh, it gives you an opportunity for your, your attention to just lock onto uh, still silence. You're not thinking, but you're not asleep. And... I think that's really an important place for your attention to be. You're not looking away from anything. You're not. You're looking directly into something in your core. Um, so, if you if you're always you know what occupies your attention? What are you what are you looking at? You're always looking um, at something. And. We all look in mirrors uh, a lot. You know, every morning you do your daily toilet or whatever. You wash your face, brush your teeth. You, you know, you look in a mirror. You get dressed. You look in a mirror. We all look in mirrors quite a bit. So it occurred to me, you know, what if when you looked into a mirror, where would your attention land if your reflection wasn't there? If you, if you walked up to a mirror and just walked right up to it, and boom, instantaneously, your the, the image of your body didn't get reflected back. Everything else was there except except your, yourself, where would your attention land? You know, for, for a moment you might be, uh, you know, you'd be stunned, you'd be surprised, but then, then it would probably, possibly land on um, the sense of you looking into the mirror. You'd have this sense of, you know, the sense of I am. And I think that's, that's part of the reflection too. You're, that, that's something, uh, that's uh, the sense of I am, the sense of your individual uh, consciousness, your individual identity, is another object of your attention. It's, it's part of the experience. So, you know, we, this, this life occurs from birth to death, and, and my mom is, is getting close to the end, and so I'm thinking, it's been on my mind a lot lately, and uh, you know, watching what what's occupying her attention right now. And to pe people, I guess I'm uh, maybe since I was with my dad when he died, I've become obsessed with or attuned to 
what's on people's minds when they die. You know, they, there's a process they go through. I'm not holding myself up as an expert on that process, but I'm very interested in what they think about it. I mean, what, what occupies their attention? Because I think um, you're never going to be more honest with yourself or more interested in looking at stuff than, uh, not at stuff, but um, you're going to be, you're not just going to be, uh, your attention's not going to be grabbed by everything that goes by, you know, um, or like flipping TV channels. You're going to be really looking, looking back on your life or looking forward to what's, what's around the corner. And I think it'd be interesting to, um, you know, imagine, imagine the two endpoints and just compress the whole thing together. You know, what is, what is occupying your attention? Um, I did a talk here a number of years ago. It was, it was a talk about going within, and I came up with this chart. I called it the object of the attention. And I was surprised by when I saw Michael's chart today. Um, is Michael here? I was, I was tempted to pull out my, my little copy of my chart and tape it on there because even though the language is utterly and completely different, I see a, a distinct similarity in the chart. And, you know, my, my chart um, talks about experience and uh, the, you know, the object of our attention is experience and that experience is either um, everything either magnifies or diminishes us. And I mean, I've, everyone's here, mo a lot of people here have heard me talk along that, those lines before, so maybe it's repetitive to say that, but uh, there's a lot of similarity in uh, even the lines that he draws through there. So the, the, the point of that was that the, proce the process of, uh, you know, spiritual path going within, um, part of that experience is a loss of self. It, you know, the, the process of going within is experienced as, as a loss of self, and we fight that. And the way we fight it is we, 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 we look away from things that create any sense of diminishment. Um, we try to replace it with something that is... Um, you know, something that's positive, or at least, you know, less, less diminishing. But one thing I know for sure is you get out in the everyday work world where you're rubbing shoulders with the rest of humanity and you're going to get, uh, have, have conflict left and right of things that are going to make you go home every night and think, you know, it, there are, there are opportunities, there are opportunities to, for self-inquiry. Well, one of, the, one of the, the earliest experiences I had with Rose, uh, the lecturer in Kent, he talked about milk, what he called milk from thorns. And he talked about um, when something provokes anger in you, instead of getting angry, notice that you're angry, and instead then stop right then and there and use the energy of that anger back to look inside yourself. And I, so, I mean, he just, he said that, and... Um, uh, shortly after that, uh, like in a matter of days, I, I had an experience that just set my head spinning. I, I was rooming with an, a guy, uh, I was looking at Kent, going to Kent State University and living off campus in an apartment um, with a guy that was a couple years older than me, and I felt like he dominated me, you know, and because um, it was his place, I moved in, he was already there, and I felt like I, I was being crowded, and but I was shy and and whatnot so i kind of put up with it and then one day there was some some issue over the dishes he, he just asked something like well did you do the dishes yet we took turns but you know it was just and i just i just immediately got angry and in that instant i remembered <laughs> what i just heard at that session and it just because i remembered it the anger immediately dissipated and i became really introspective and i like i i put my coat on as fast as I could because I had to get away from him so I could think. And so I went on this uh, long, long walk and um, it's like my, it's like a bomb went off in my head. My, every, my, I felt like 
part of the combination was uh, being exposed to all these ideas uh, of a couple lectures from Rose. And then this, this event happened that uh, created this wad of energy and I put it back into my mind and now is, my mind was like doing a reorg. It was like the whole database was getting reorged um, with all this new information. So that was a, to me that was a, I never forgot that it was like the example of um, the power of using uh, negative emotions or any kind of diminishment experience as the fuel for self-inquiry. Of course, he said you, you, you can't do it when the, you know, you can't be angry and meditate. You know, you have to get past the anger. So, and this, this, this was such a trivial incident of anger, it was pretty easy to get past, you know, but I still had the energy from it. Experience is binding. An intense experience is intensely binding. And sex is a pretty intense experience. Um, of course, pain, pain can be intense, you know, so an experience of pain can bind people. And, and I've, I've seen examples of this, you know, people go through really, really traumatic injuries and or ordeals of uh, one sort, and um, it doesn't necessarily make them introspective because it's such an intense experience, it actually locks them into an identity. When you were talking about pain, I can relate to pain and pain being binding. And, um, and a conversation that we were having earlier when we were talking in here, like where I am, you know, get to the heart of the matter, right? Okay, so I'm here because I want to get enlightened, right? And um, that's the heart of the matter. And I've been wanting to get enlightened as far as I can remember all my freaking life, you know? And um, I never had Rose or, you know, I mean, I did, did want to be a nun and all that. But what I realized just recently in reading Eckhart Tolle and talking about the pain body, because I am so identified with pain. Yeah, I like what he writes about that. And I, um, you know, I am a home household or whatever you call it, but I'm, you know, so I mean, I have all of that stuff to do, but always, you know, you know, I want to get enlightened still. Um, but what I recognized is my pain brings me back to the, to the quest always. If I get distracted in life, when I'm in any kind of pain, it's going to bring me right back to, okay, what's the point of this? And also, I've realized that when life was good, I had everything I wanted, the emptiness of life and the pain of the pointlessness of it brings me back to the quest. So always the pain right. brings me back to the quest. Well, pleasure but, doesn't make you, doesn't inspire you to go sit in a corner and think, But you know. But what I finally realized is that my, my pain body, part of my pain body was my identity as a quester. Is that, you know, this whole thing is like, yeah, you know, like God, you know, I want to get, you know, and it's, so it was like, I realized all of this pain associated with being on the path and not getting anywhere. And that, so now where I'm at is like trying to let go of wanting to get there and just kind of like be there. Well, he, if I, it's been a while since I've read his book, but I think <laughs> when he writes about the pain body, he, he writes about the uh, attachment to it. People get attached becomes part of the identity, right? Right. And when you say that, um, sounds like I'm shifting gears, but I'm not. When you say that you, you know, you want enlightenment, of course, you, you have to create a definition of that for yourself, because how can you, you don't, you can't know what something is that you don't already have, right? So you have a, you have an idea of what it is. So it's kind of a, um, it, it calls into question. So what, what is it that you really want? It's like saying, I want, I want acne. I want, so you have a concept of, you know, so my concept of, of, of whatever uh, is that it will, uh, well, for most people, that it will add something to me. You know, it will, it will add happiness or it will add peace of mind. I mean, it might do those things, but um, it's, it's not going to, if it adds anything to you, it's not going to add anything to you before it takes everything else away. Yeah. <laughs> well, what is your question about the pain, though? I mean, you, so you're, you're, you, you, 
I made the well, comment that, about that Tali because like, it sounded like where you're going is that you're you become identified with your pain. So you're thinking that the way to stop identifying that is to say, okay, I don't want enlightenment anymore. Exactly. That's kind of why I talked about exactly. it. I said, well, how, so you, but you didn't, what was it that you really wanted in the first place? You okay, want free well, of the pain. So you really haven't changed what you want. No, wait, 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 wait. No, I'm getting confused. <laughs> um, no, I want to, I want to know what the fuck I'm doing here. You know what I mean? And to me, that's like enlightenment. Like, know who you okay. are, what's your purpose, what's, you know, what, what, you know, what am I doing here? Always. What am I doing here? Like I said, the pain leads you back on, whether it's, you know, the pain of life itself or the pain of, you know, the pointlessness of life. I mean, in other words, a, a, a death, a loss or, you know, grief or something, you know, or just realizing that what's the point of all of this? You know what I mean? And so then that makes you go back on the path, try to figure out who you are, what you're doing here. Right? What, how, do you, how do you see your path? I mean, and what comprises a path for you? Um, just that, trying to figure out how, how, how do you do, how do you do that? I mean, in, I individually, that? yeah, I mean, besides coming to meetings like this. Um, praying, writing, going to 12 steps, looking at myself, trying to just, trying to just be aware of what's going on, who I am, what I think, what I feel. Do you, do you um, meditate? Yeah, I meditate now. I had tried to meditate before and I couldn't meditate. I mean, because I thought there was a perfect way to meditate and I wasn't able to stop my thoughts. And so then I just decided that meditation is a practice, kind of like, you know, being a lawyer. <laughs> For some reason that connected me, you know, because I thought, okay, it's a practice, so I don't have to know how to do it. I just have to keep doing it. So I've made a commitment and I do that every day to meditate. And what is meditation to you? What is meditation to me? Sitting down, being quiet, and um, just kind of like what he said. I've actually tried some other things too, like um, some, like, you know, like, okay, trying to feel, like if I have a feeling, okay, bring up, like I'll just tell you, you know, I bring up a story, and then it, it raises a feeling, then you try to get rid of the story, mm -hmm. you know what I mean, and you go down, 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 sit with the story, that's one thing. Or I've asked like my feelings to sit with me, you know, and then you just bow to them and just let them sit there and see what they are. And I've had some kind of interesting experiences with that. Or just be still and do the over the mantra, you know, and just do that kind of. But I always like kind of feel like I'm dreaming and then come out of it. So that was kind of interesting that he said that because that's my experience. I feel like I'm dreaming and then I come out of it and get centered again. And I, so that was kind of interesting to see that, that I'm doing that right. <laughs> I mean, or at least it followed yeah. his pattern. But my point was, when we were talking, he, see, so I'm reached the point now where I want to quit trying because I recognize that I try too much. So I'm trying to quit trying. And then somebody had said that you need to keep trying. And? <laughs> and I, I don't know if I should quit trying or keep trying. <laughs> well, I guess, you know, you can find 10 people with 10 different answers. I can give you my answer. <laughs> I mean, my, or, you know, if myself, the advice that I got and the advice that I took was that um, I meditated on trauma. So I, I, I looked at afflictions to the sense of self. And the way I would explain how, how that practice should be done, um, and, and Rose always uh, talked about looking, you can't, it's difficult to look at uh, an immediate affliction to the sense of self because you can't look at something while you're angry. You know, while you're, it's kind of like you have to transcend the anger and then look at it. So it's easy to do that with something that happened five years ago. Maybe you can look at something from a year ago, three months ago, last week. It might be pretty hard. But, um, and so what, what do you actually do? Do you, the advice was, okay, you, 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 watch the event you 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 re you don't relive it but you look at what happened you look at the you know the circumstances and what triggered the the anger or the whatever the emotion was um and that's gonna that's gonna immediately um generate a lot of thought 
and at that, it's at that point that I can relate to Michael's system of meditation, um, because I think that same pattern occurs there. You know, you. So what I would say that I like his system, except I like the mantra to be the affliction to the sense of self. I think in the the with every experience of diminishment or affliction in the sense of self. And for an instant, just in a, a you're in one timeless instant, you have a you are absolutely directly open. You have an open pathway to see back all the way to your source, but you instantly look away because uh, going within is is a, is a experience of loss of self, and that's painful. So you instantly look away, and that looking away is experienced as this rush of thought. Yeah, when you were reading the email, you mentioned. Uh the uh, passage in the Pouillon letter that triggered something for you. And uh, I wondered if you would, you know, say that passage and talk a little bit about how it struck you. Um, the passage was, well, the context for it, I have to provide the context. Uh, it was a letter from Pouillon to Richard Rose answering a list of questions that Rose had given him. And I knew what those questions would have had to have been from my knowledge of Richard Rose and listening to him talk. And he, for example, he always said every religion, uh, every spiritual teaching needs to answer three basic questions. Uh, where did you come from? Who are you? And where are you going? Meaning, you know, what was my source? What's, what am, what's the purpose of life? What's my meaning in the world? And what happens to me when I die? Okay, so what happens to me when I die is really the, the big one, right? So, Pullion was running down this list of questions, or answers to these questions, and Pullion was uh, generally pretty concise in his answers, and you know, he cut to the chase. Um, and then, he, in the other context was when I was reading these letters, um, even though I quit, I, I was I was somehow inspired to uh, participate in a, an online group that Art Tickner, um, Steve Harnish. I'm trying to think who were there were three of it. And that's a separate story. I won't go there. Anyway, so I was participating in this online group, and we decided to use the Pullian letters as our material. So when I was reading these letters, I made up my mind. I mean, I had the whole stack of letters, but I decided I was not going to read them like a book. I decided I was going to read them uh, in about as much time as I, they would have come through the post, you know, the old-fashioned way. It's not instant communication. You get a letter, and you actually have to think about it for a few days. No instant message reply. So, the, the, so I, I held my head that way, and I would read a letter. And the first letter I read really set the tone. I mean, boy, did it set the tone. So anyway, when I got, when I got to this letter and was reading these questions, Pullion, these letters were my letters, and he was writing to me, not Richard Rose. I mean, that, that, that was how they were coming across for me. So I get to this one letter, and he and, um, goes, okay, regarding the question. Well, I knew immediately what that question was. So my knowledge of Richard Rose. Goes, regarding the question, um, the body dies and is dissipated. The mind, which is likewise at all, uh, which is at all times one with the body, likewise dies and is dissipated. Nothing of you will remain. And my frame of mind at the time is, um, well, you know, I, I don't have time to get into my whole, you know, the whole state of mind and everything, but I can say this much. I was, it was late at night. I was reading this letter um, to get the letter read. And then I was going to next, the next day I was going to work on, because it was my turn to be the monitor and I was going to have to write some commentary on this letter. And so when the words, when I got, you know, I'm thinking, oh boy, I'm going to hear what Pullian says. Pullian is about to answer the question. And I had, a, I had an idea of what he was going to say, and, and it wasn't what he said. I mean, I thought he was going to say something along the lines of, of Ekatali or Amana Maharshi or Nisargadatta, and it was going to hear about this wonderful thing that, uh, well, this was the answer. And it was, um, Okay, the body dies and is dissipated. Okay, all right. Yeah, I know that. We all know that, right? Everybody, nobody in this room thinks that they're their body. Okay, they think you know, I could, I could decapitate you from down, and you'd still be you. 
you know, not for very long. <laughs> um, so that got that perked my ears up. It, got, it locked my attention on the answer. I mean, this all happened very quickly, right? Because I'm reading this phrase, but. Um, then where he got me was the mind, which is, is at all times one with the body. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, we always assume that you're, you know, like Rose told the lady one time uh, that was talking about some terrible experience she had, and she said, well, it's, it's only my body. And he said, well, how about we send your body to Pittsburgh and keep you here? And she looked at him with this puzzled look. But we think that way. We think that we're independent of our body. We all, we really do. And I did. So, but just in that moment when he said, the mind is at all times one with the body, I just, I accepted. I knew it was right. And he says, likewise dies and is dis dissipated. He had me, I was suspended at that point. You know, I mean, I just couldn't argue with it. Uh, so it's like he, he, the setup was there. He had suspended my disbelief or pride, you know, created the, I accepted that. And the, the punchline, nothing of you will remain, was like the tablecloth going, you know, the, you know, the cliche of the magician snapping the tablecloth off the table and every object on the table stays exactly in the same position. That's kind of what it felt like. He didn't say nothing remains. He said, nothing of you remains. And I don't know how to explain it, but in, in that moment, um, I accepted my own death. I died. I mean, it was, it was like, it was, it was jarring. I mean, I didn't, it was, I was so tired at the end of the day, I couldn't deal with it. And I was already in a pretty depressed state because of a whole bunch of other factors going on. And I remember uh, putting the letter down and just stumbling down the hallway to go to bed and thinking to myself, you know, now this. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, the th I think the thing that really, uh, now this, this was the beginning of, of the unraveling. I mean, I don't know. It's, I think back on it, I think, well, that's the moment when realization occurred. But yet something, it, it wasn't finished. It's, I could point to a later time uh, within a week or 10 days where, no, that was the real point. There was, there was a second more uh, point. Uh, uh, so I went to bed. I mean, I felt I felt dissociated from my my body. I, I didn't feel right. But I went to bed because I was on this treadmill. I had to, it was treadmill of work, and I was it's another whole story. But I had to keep I had to I had to keep pedaling. Um, so I went to bed, and I remember the next morning I got up, and the first thing I did was put my foot on the floor and stop to see if I still felt really weird. And I did. I still felt discombobulated, but I didn't have time to think about it. I had to get up, get ready for bed, get breakfast, go to work. And so this, this odd situation went on for, I guess, about a week. I don't know. I didn't keep a journal. It's um, fuzzy on the time. But it was like in between the... Uh, I worked at a computer doing programming and whatnot, so I'd be totally focused and absorbed in my work. And then in, the, in, in any break time, like stopping typing and getting from my chair to go get a printout, in that space of time, I would revert back to this. Uh, I would just collapse back into myself and feel the same dissociation. So this went on for, uh, and again, I, I didn't have time to think about this, which I keep saying it because I think it was really important that I didn't. I think if I had... If I had sat down to meditate about this, I think it would have just stopped whatever was, I, I would have killed, killed it somehow. Um, uh, my wife, and ki my, I worked at home, I was self-employed, and my wife didn't work, so she was home. So I had no space to be alone. So I, that was the other thing. I felt like I had to keep a lid on, <coughs> on whatever was happening. So one day I, um, I got in the car and I uh, went out to run some errand. And, you know, this was really prominent. It was really hanging on the edge of, of my uh, mind, so to speak. And I don't know how to describe it other than, you know, I just, I got not, almost angry. I'm driving the car. And by the way, the, the significance of the car for me, too, is that whatever is going on, when you're in the car, you are uh, at the center of motion. You know, you are the still center and everything around you is moving. 
So I think that was uh, kind of dovetailed what was what, what was going on. So I, I remember kind of uh, literally grimacing, saying, "What is this?" And I, I you know I, I wanted I, and I popped through. I, I say it that way because in that moment, it's like I was. I mean, I, I, I would, I don't know, to relate, it, let's think about this chart earlier because I don't, I don't agree that um, I, realization is not an experience. There's a real paradox here. I can't explain it, but um, what he called this line, this is as far as you can go, this is the, um, I'd call this individual consciousness here. And I, I popped, to me, that was an object. That was an object in the attention. And I remember, here I am driving a car. This is in Raleigh on, on Glenwood Avenue between the airport and um, Pleasant Valley, whatever. And I remember shaking my head like this, saying, there is no death. There's nothing to die. There is no death. And so I was in this, you know, I, I, I completed my er errand and I drove home and I remember driving the drive home, how, how I felt completely, I felt like I was, uh, Bob Sergal, the individual consciousness continued on as something I could witness. When I say I witnessed, I, I wasn't witnessing it. I mean, I was, I was, I was omnipresent. I was, uh, and I remember having the thought too, thinking, that, well, so what if I, drove home and turned the corner and I saw my house in flames and my, I knew my family was inside and they were dying. How would that feel? I don't know where that thought came from, but it popped into my mind. And I saw that, I saw, yeah, boy, uh, this Bob Sergal who was driving the car, he would be really tore up by that. You know, I saw the pain and anguish that that would be, but it was still out there with the rest of the experience. So uh, that's why I talked the way I do. I mean, to, what is the object of your attention? And there is the possibility that Wolf, Merrill Wolf, talks about uh, consciousness without an object. In, it, I, 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 prefer, I use the word awareness as distinct from consciousness. Consciousness, to me, is the word I use for individual. Uh, localized awareness or individuality. Um, awareness is not that. Awareness is what powers it. So anyway, so those, I mean, those simple words were, to, to use the, the other guy's phrase, a, a tur the turning word for me. And I can't tell you how many people have read those letters and it didn't have the, that effect on them. But, but something else will have the, the effect on them at the right time. And you don't, you don't know when that time will be for you. It could be on your deathbed. You know, it could be tomorrow. Bob, uh, can you cast your mind back to the time when you read that letter? How would you have answered the question that you got exactly the answer the from? <laughs> I've, I've, I've answered it, it that way. I mean, I think I, I, I think I had. Now, uh, now you have, but at that point, before reading his oh, response. Oh, before I read the letter, yeah. Yes. Um, well, I had, I, you know, I thought Rose was going to send the wheelbarrow for me, and he didn't. And I thought, well, I've given up on the search. But you know what? That's not 100% true either. I really thought that, okay, I mean, I believed I wasn't going to find the answer during my lifetime. But I, Rose said the other opportunity was at the moment of your death. So I thought, well, that's what's going to happen. I'm going to, I'm going to have this dignified, graceful death. And the, you know, I was way too smart to think that angels were going to carry me to heaven. I mean, that was for ch children to believe, right? And I was much more wise than that. So I believed that I was going to, you know, become enlightened. And I was still conceiving it as an addition to me. Enlightenment was going to add something to me uh, eternally. And, and you know, you, you know, I, I am eternal, but you know, I, you can't. You know, the, the I that I'm using in the I am is not the body sitting in front of you or the personality that's generating this, these words. Um, so I thought that I'd paid, I'd made the investment, 
I mean, I literally, literally thought the thing I said about to you earlier. You know, I, I just conceded. You know, I put in my investment. It was accruing interest, and I was going to get it at the other end. I really believe that. So that's why I, I was open to Poyan's words, and it was such a shocker. I couldn't deny them. It just, it, it was. I've, I've often thought about the cleverness of the phrasing of that. You know how premeditated it was, or if it was just kind of off the cuff, but the sequence of it, okay, because no one's going to disagree with you that the body dies and is dissipated, you know, it's going to turn into dust. Everybody accepts that, but what nobody accepts, nobody believes, everybody in this room, no matter how many times you hear it, everybody thinks enlightenment is going to add something to you. You cannot conceive about, um, you know, in any other way, because all the momentum and the machinery is built in I mean, you're operating through this identity, which is concocted. So, uh, did you did you believe in reincarnation at all at that time? No, I never, and I didn't. I didn't really. In, in all my readings and thinking and stuff, I didn't dwell on that subject. I didn't. I mean, I didn't think about it enough to say no. It's, it can't be because I can. I can conceive of within the within the dream, you know. There could be something called reincarnation, but from from the perspective that I gained, I say I gained. That's that's kind of a, a bad way to put it, but you know, can't talk any other way because somehow this this personality that that's the paradox of it. You know, who who had this? See, I think real it, it was a realization, but the realization is accompanied by an experience in. In the field, uh, you know, it's like uh, layers of experience. So there's this. Um, I, I, I'm kind of digress. I, I explained it to myself this way: that it's not even it's not within even the power of God to divide Himself. So He can shatter into a million pieces, but every piece, everything He touches, is God. He just He doesn't have. He can be all powerful, but he doesn't have the power to split himself. And so, um, to go back to my mirror analogy, the you know uh, the creation is you know uh, God wanted to see his reflection, and before eye contact occurred, the the reflection turned away. I would like to ask it again the same question another way. Uh, like we have certain expectation. Of enlightenment. What was yours before you read the letter? Oh, uh, uh, it was Super Bob. Super Bob. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Super Bob. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's too, the most abbreviated way to say it, isn't it? <laughs> No, because um, you know, if you want to use those kind of words, you know, it's you don't you don't possess a soul. You, you might be a soul, but then you have to get into what is the definition of a soul. So, I, you know, I could I could answer your question and say, no, I am a, I am soul. I mean, at that time before before the, the question, did you did I believe that I had have a soul that you would have a soul that would mm -hmm. survive? And be oh. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I didn't conceive it as a soul. Again, I was way too smart and educated. And, you know, I read too many spiritual books to, you know, be so foolish as to think, thought, you know, think that I had a soul. You know, it's like, no, I mean, I, I didn't know what a soul was. I mean, what I did know is that, you know, I have this sense of identity, sense of self. And so I thought that that would somehow be launched into this super expanded, and I don't know, you know, it's hard to conceive, whatever, that's why Super Bob is just kind of a way to, I don't know what I thought, I just thought I was going to, all my problems would be solved, I'd have eternal happiness, and um, the other, you know, I always hear this phrase, people say that, you know, God is within, and I think that's, I mean, it's semantics perhaps, but I think it's, Back, it's backwards it, or upside down or something. It's that, you know, uh, no, I mean, we abide in God. God doesn't abide in us. We all, 
in other words, again, that's the egocentric position again. We are and we think that we are anterior to God Himself, and so He's He we contain Him. I mean, I, I'm falling back on my Catholic language, I suppose. Here, I don't mind using the word God. Rose hated it. Whenever he uses, he, he liked to use the word absolute. Um, but whatever the ultimate, the ultimate reality. You didn't know that you were looking for the disintegration of self? No, you know, Rose talked that he didn't, um, he talked about reverse vector. He talked about retreating from untruth. Um, he didn't use words like deconstructing the self. He, he, he said, he talked about defining the self and self-inquiry. I mean, he, I don't know if he was cagey or just, he really avoided, um, getting too far ahead of you and giving you all these hints because he didn't want you to uh, have a lot of preconceptions. He just, his, his whole teaching method was just all about stirring, stirring you up. You know, um, on the one hand, putting out a set of principles, you know, you got to conserve your energy. You got to do meditation. You got to work on a group level. You know, you have to work, you have to do the threefold path. The Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha, he said, correlated with the way, the truth, and the life on the Christian side. So he talked a lot about it, that sort of thing. Um, and then once in a while, rarely, you know, maybe after a rapport sitting or something, he, he might, at the, as the trailing comment of a long paragraph, he might say something like, you know, but then you find out that you didn't have any choice in the matter, or then, you know, you find out that there was nobody there all along, you know, and None of it made any sense, so you never, I, I, I didn't notice or remember those comments nearly as much as all the other ones. So no, I never conceived it. I, I don't think anybody did. I'm quite sure everybody in the group conceived of it as we're adding stuff to ourselves. We're going to, by eliminating some hang-up uh, or trauma or flaw, I mean, I guess that's how I conceived it. I was going to, I would uh, retreat from error meant that I would retreat from some erroneous thinking which caused me pain and resulted in a flaw and therefore I'd become better. So absent that flaw, I'd become improved and so I'd be adding something to myself. When did you become objective about the desire for self as Truly, something you that's driving you in a real, in a way you can actually see it. I think it's, I think it's, it's started after I got married because that my decision to get married was the beginning of my uh, acceptance or recognition of the fact that you know I'm not. Rose isn't going to solve this problem for me after all, and I've been kidding myself. You know, I was. I was like uh, 30, I was 19 years old when I met Rose, and I was 37 years old, 36 or 37 years old before I said, you know what, I'm, this, isn't gonna, this isn't working. And so I thought, you know, we're, we're, I, had a, I had a moment, a real, I lived in my cabin for a year, and, and um, so I, you know, you face yourself in isolation, and I was in a year-long isolation in, in a way, and you don't, you know, stuff just come bubbles up, and something that bubbled up one day is, you know, I just had to face. Okay, this isn't working. What, what do I at least want out of my life if I can't have enlightenment? And I decided I wanted to be connected to humanity. I felt so, just so um, outside of the world, disengaged. I wanted to be engaged with the world and become part of the rest of humanity that I looked down my nose at for the previous 25 years. And I thought, well, I, that, and so what does that mean? How do I translate that? Well, okay, I guess that means you do what everybody else does. You get married and you have kids and you work. And I thought that's what I'll do. And then I'll, you know, I'll have relationships, you know, connectedness. To, you know, I came from a large family, you know, there'd be a hundred people at weddings. So that's what I wanted 
that's how I saw my future. But I also really sincerely had the attitude that um, I would accept it. If I would accept whatever came. I mean, I took action. So I thought, well, okay, if, if I'm if if I say that this is what I want to do, I have to uh, back that up with some action. And the action was to move out of my cabin to to declare that that's what I wanted and to live in my cabin would have been a lie, wouldn't it? <laughs> so I moved to Annapolis. And I, and I was I, I, I don't, I'm not one, I was never a sociable person. So I moved to Annapolis and I forced myself to join a bicycle club. I was going to get out and mingle with people, you know? And, and so I got married. But to, to answer, get back to your question, I think um, when my things got unleashed so quickly with my family, you know, I got married, my wife got pregnant, we moved, bought a new house. I was self-employed. My business was, I could see the, the end point of it. All this stuff happened within a year's time. And, and yet it's like all this whole other life was just had a, a trajectory of its own. And I, I felt dissociated from it. So it was becoming dreamlike. And I got, and my relatives start dying. And I, I just, I, I really did get to the point where I just, I, I, I stopped expecting a reward, mostly, not 100%, you know, because in the back of my mind, I thought, well, okay, not during my life, but at the point of death, so I'll just go ahead and live this life, and then I'll get my reward at the very end. So you had ceased wanting to resolve the problem with Bob? Yeah, I think that, and I think that, well, maybe, man, I, don't know, I didn't conceive it that way, but I think my attitude... You, you said, when did I start uh, start seeing, objectively seeing my, I don't know that I ever, I didn't think about it in those terms. It's just that I think it put, I had the right attitude or openness so that when things happened, uh, uh, I could I could look at them uh, and not, I didn't spin things as much. I could just kind of look and see what was going on. And, you know, I was certainly open to those words from Paul. And I mean, if I had read that letter a year or any, you know, prior to a year or any time before that, I don't think it would have had any effect at all. And it wouldn't, I wouldn't have even know what the, what's he talking about, you know. I wouldn't have believed it. I feel that after you read that letter, that was the day you actually gave up. You realize that not well, that, oh, it could be. I mean, I definitely, I definitely felt like I accepted. In that moment, I accepted death. I accepted death when I when I accepted those words, but the the realization didn't happen until that second uh, point. And you know, I, I um, super Bob died that day. <laughs> I was really surprised by it because I had, for Rose had created this uh, concept in me of enlightenment um, that it was, you know, he always talked about, well, they're going to carry you out on a stretcher and you're going to go through this, just this intense um, breakdown, like a nervous breakdown. And that's not how that, but you know, I, that's not how it went for me. But yet, I, uh, when I looked, Back on all the years preceding that, I could see that there was a there was a many years of unraveling that I didn't realize what was going on, and where I had many many episodes of um, you know, painful. Uh, they weren't nervous breakdowns, but I did a lot of crying. <laughs> How's that? Um, One one thing that led up or happened in the in, within the preceding years, um, my wife took the uh, uh, she was pregnant and she took our other daughter up to Ohio for a visit. Uh, I was going to join her a week uh, a week later, so I was home alone for the first time since I left my cabin, and um, some things happened. Things were coming to a head somehow and, and I had a, a breakdown or something where I, I saw I feel like I I think I had the mountain experience that Rose talked about I saw I saw things life as an illusion and it, I was totally totally depressed by it I thought there was 
I was absolutely convinced that there was no answer. And I was, I remember kind of talking out loud, I was crying, I was saying, I was angry at Rose. Why would you, why would you, put, you know, uh, promote this? Why would you have anybody go in this direction? It was you know, such a terrible thing to see, you know, because I thought that that's, I thought I was seeing the final thing. And I called him up, I'm over, it's the only time I ever did that in all the decades that I had been around him and many times had the urge to call him and I always be too self-conscious about it, like, Oh, I'm just making much ado about nothing. But this, I needed to talk to him. I called up the farm. He was he was living out here at the time. Cece answered the phone, and I asked for him. And as soon as I heard his voice, I knew he couldn't help me. There was just something in the sound of his voice. He was already in the stages of Alzheimer's, and he just he just wasn't. Pre but he did. I started to talk to him, and all he said was, well, sometimes it helps to write things down. <laughs> um, I had a lot of uh, uh, experiences with him over the, over the years. Sometimes I should write them down. I, I, I can't think of them all at once sitting down, but occasionally they come to me and really remarkable things, you know, the kind of things that you read about in the literature that people find entertaining, you know. You know, one, one happened um, at the Alzheimer's unit. I had, um, it was a tap meeting. We were still meeting down at the farmhouse in the wing, and I think maybe Art was doing the meeting or something. But it was about it was on death, and I I think my uncle I, I'm hazy on the time frames now, but anyway, I got really upset, and my mind got into a certain place. This is before my realization, but I was teetering. I was on the you know for there was a period of time lead up to this. So I was kind of on the uh, edge, and I, it, I was in a strange state of mind. I felt completely alone, and the wor world was very dreamlike and unreal. And we all went to visit Rose the next day, and I was feeling this really intensely when I got there. And you know, he, I just, I'd visited him many times before this, and you know, was totally non-communicative because of the Alzheimer's. And this time he. He got up from the room we always met in, and he walked out to the hallway and stood by a window and looked out the window and was just standing there. And I walked up, and I stood next to him. I was looking out the window, and I felt this the intensity welling up in me of this whatever I was experiencing. And this man who had had Alzheimer's and had been in, in, in the hospital or the, the home or whatever for, at that point, probably eight years, standing next to me, reached over and put his hand on top of my hand and said, there's nobody here, is there? And that's exactly how I felt. And, and he, you know, I heard my, I told this story to someone else just recently. I remember thinking, well, you know, was it a hallucination? Did, I, did he actually say that? No, I mean, I mean, people were standing right behind me. I don't think anyone else heard him. But it was not, a, not an imagination where I, thought I heard him say that he he said it the air came out of his mouth you know it really amazed me that he how did he generate those words and I never heard any I never heard anything but gibberish out of him out of him again until you know up and ever again was that a transmission was that what a transmission like he talks about transmission so. mm -hmm. um, I, I I think there was a, I mean, boy, that's a, a lot of people don't like that word because it sounds like, okay, I've got a dart gun here and I'm going to pull the trigger and a, a dart's going to travel across the room from me to you and hit you. But, you know, a better way to think about it is uh, a tuning fork. You know, if, you have, if a fork's vibrating and a uh, fork's over here, it just starts vibrating the same. The difference is, is that tuning forks have to be like a half inch apart. But in, in, when it comes to essence, there's no space and time. So I don't know. You could, you could. I, I, I think there was transmission. I think um, 
I think there was a transmission from from Rose that happened very, very early in my association with him. And then I spent the next 20 years running away from it because to have uh, received the transmission would have required a uh, dying. And, you know, it takes people a long time to die. You know, it's you, you have to go through, well, I mean, you're, you're my, you know, my whole momentum was building my identity at that time. So I, my history with him was coming and going. I'd, I'd come around him and I'd have to get away from him. I'd live at, I'd li I lived in his house for six months and then I moved to Houston for two years. And then I came back and I, this time I lived across the river in Bel Air. I lived there for a year, but you know, the close proximity and the interaction, I have to get away from him. Um, and I think it was just one interpretation I, I could cast backward looking on it was I went through this long circuitous route to come around to what he had somehow given me to understand or in, in some way. Why, why did he keep away from him? You didn't believe him? It, it, was, it was intense, the confrontation. I mean, he was, he was, he depressed me. He did. I mean, he, he, life seemed hopeless. He, he, he generated he generated the doubt sensation in me, I'll tell you that. You know, it was like, well, what's the point? You know, I, you know, you seem, he struck me as a tragic figure and, and spurred, I was like, I don't want, you know, I don't want to end up where you did. I don't want to end up like you. It doesn't seem like much fun. <laughs> But you were attracted to something also because you kept coming back. Well, because I I could feel him somehow. I at the when I first met him at the first talk, that talk at Kent State, um, I walked into the room and he was sitting in a chair like one of the audience members, and I happened to sit down right behind him. And man, I could something about this odd old man that's sitting in front of me. What's he doing here? I could just feel electricity around him. And then I was a little bit surprised when he got up. And started speaking, but um, the thing about him is, he made uh, he made the the um, we realized that the, that something called enlightenment or final a final answer to all the questions of life and death was. Uh, real that it, there really was an answer and that he had it and that it was a possibility for you. I mean, you, up until that time, I, in my case, I had never read any books about that. I, the whole concept of spiritual work was new to me. That's why it was so appealing. Well, I can that could be my career. I mean, I'd been raised Catholic, so I had that teaching, but you know, I didn't know I'd not read any Zen or uh, Buddhism or Hinduism or anything. So. That was the attraction that he could. I also saw him as someone he could. I felt like I had problems. I mean, I, I, I was pretty average, I think, but I felt like I needed help, and I, I just knew that that guy is a guy he could, he could cure me. You no, know, I don't think I needed cure. It wasn't like I was neurotic, and unless, like Jim Burns would say, well, everybody's neurotic. I really enjoyed visiting with you.